Would you stand with me across the building right now? So thankful that you've come to the house of the Lord today. Let's open our Bibles. We're going to look at the book of Acts, chapter number 10. I'll give you a moment to find your old-fashioned Bible or your open up your iPad or your, or your phones and look at it as long as you don't text after you opened it up. That's great. Acts chapter number 10. As we start this year, I want to uh, speak to you about how God operates in a progressive manner. God is a progressive God. If you notice, he tells Abraham, take your son, your only son, and offer him as a sacrifice. When he gets there, trying to be obedient with the knife in the air, he hears the voice a second time say, no, don't do it. So if he would have only listened to the first voice, he would have killed that boy. But there was a progression of revelation that was going on that was required for him to stay in step with God to hear the next thing that he was saying. Oftentimes, we only hear that first thing that God says, and after we've heard him once, we say, well, I know what he said. I know what his word says. I know what it means. But we don't keep listening. This is oftentimes what happens in movements. They start off with powerful surges of God's blessing and miracles and revelation knowledge and people are praying and then it kind of wanes after a while because people stop listening and they don't continue to walk with him. So God has to use another group in another place and for more progressive revelation. The book of Isaiah says line upon line, here a little and there a little. This is how he speaks. How many want to take another step with God today? Ready to take another step with God? As we come into this new season, we got to hear God for 2020. I know we've heard him for the last decade, but what, God, what is God saying for this decade and where are we going? So let's look at the book of Acts chapter number 10. And uh, I will read through these verses, but we'll, we'll jump fairly quickly. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian Band. It wasn't a rock group, kids, just so you know. <clears throat> A devout man and one that feared God with all of his house, which gave much alms. Everyone say, gave alms. And he prayed to God always. Everyone say, he prayed always. He saw in a vision, evidently, about the ninth hour of the day. Uh, this would be 3 o'clock. An angel of God. Everyone say, he saw an angel coming into him. And he said, Cornelius. And when he looked at him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? Thy prayers and thy alms are come up for a memorial before God. Your consistent giving and your consistent prayers have gotten God's attention. Now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon whose name is Peter. He lodges with Simon a tanner whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell you what you what thou oughtest to do. He's going to tell you your next steps. He's going to tell you what your prayers and what you're giving, all of your earnestness and trying to serve the Lord, he's going to show you how to take your next step. And when the angel spake unto Cornelius uh, was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier that waited on them continually. And when he declared all these things, he sent them to Joppa. And so we see verse number 9, on the morrow as they went on their journey and drew nigh into the city, Peter went up unto the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten but while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit on the four corners and let down to the earth. Wherein all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and fowl of the air. And there came a voice to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Everyone say, rise, kill and eat. We're fasting. Everyone's fasting. Rise kill and eat but Peter said not so Lord for I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean and the voice spake unto him the second time everyone say the second time see this progression what God hath cleansed that call not thou common this was done thrice and the vessel was received up into heaven while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean behold the men which were sent from Cornelius made inquiry and stood before the gate, verse 18, and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, lodged there. Verse 19, while Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing. 
for I have sent them. I'm going to talk to you for a little bit on this subject. Make the shift. Make the shift. Let's lift our hands, let's lift our voice, and let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for what you are doing in this place. We thank you, Lord, for every one of us that you have prepared for this very moment. We ask you, God, for revelation and for understanding. We pray, God, that you would help us to get out of our own way, that our own traditions, our own customs, our own uh, understanding would not impede you. But, Lord Jesus, give us that breakthrough revelation knowledge that will help us to go to the next level and that will help everyone else oh God that is depending upon us to go to the next level you are moving us into a new season father and we bind every resisting spirit whether human or demonic and we pray your perfect will will be done everybody say in Jesus name turn to two or three people and say make the shift make the shift and then you may be seated God works in patterns he works in patterns. He works in cycles. He created cycles in the beginning of the world, and then he stepped back and rested. This is good. And from that point on, there was always going to be a, a day one, a day two, a day three, a day four, a day five, a day six, and a day seven. There was not going to be an eighth day unless it was something in the calendar. But for him, this is our week. It's a cycle. And then he says, I'm going to have the stars in the sky, and they're going to be for times and for seasons and for days and years. I'm going to explain things through these appointed times. I'm going to use time in a certain way, and I'm going to have a cycle. It's going to be a season. And so he built us in a certain way that we have seasons and that we have cycles and we have patterns. All through the Old Testament, you see that God worked through patterns. We call them types or shadows. When you come to the New Testament, you realize that a shadow is defined or made by something or someone standing in the light. So the shadow is indicating that there is a light for us to look at. And so when Jesus came into the world, he was that light. He is the light of the world. That everything in the Old Testament was pointing towards something. And now we know who he is. John said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. Aren't you thankful that we have the light today? John was not that light, but he came to bear witness of that light, the Bible says. So there was light. When we have light, we're, we, we, we begin to walk in the light. And 1 John 1 says, walk in the light as he is in the light. And then there is a process of transformation that happens. So you see the book of Acts is not just our history. The book of Acts is our pattern for the church. We can learn how we should compare ourselves in this modern time, how we should apply the principle of the concept of church by using the scriptures as our guide, as our blueprint. The most amazing thing about the Word of God is that no matter which generation you might be reading it in, it applies. It never gets old. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. It never gets stale. It never changes. It is always life. How many know that when you read the word, it applies to now? Can you find yourself in the Word of God today? Has something from the Word of God been able to minister to your life now? And yet the people that penned it, the moment they penned it, it was exactly for the people that they were penning it for that day that it was first given to them. It is amazing. The Word of God. So what we see is a pattern of God, very, very specifically explained by Jesus before He ascended. He said, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you'll be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and then the uttermost parts of the earth. So he gives us the progression of how the Holy Spirit was going to be poured out. It was going to first start with the Jews. It was going to be Jewish people because these were the people of God that had covenant that God had explained all of these things to and had given the holy ordinances to. So it started with the Jews. And then it went to the Samaritans. And then from the Samaritans it would go to the uttermost parts. That's everyone who is not a Jew. That's what we call a Gentile. And so each of those uh, peoples were reached in a different way. 
how God dealt with Jews was different from how God would dealt with Samaritans and how God dealt with Samaritans was different than how he dealt with Gentiles. What I read to what I read to you today is that this is the pattern for the Gentiles, for the non-Jewish people. It was different. In the book of Acts, we read that they prayed and they tarried for seven days in the upper room until they all sat down and they were in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire that sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. That's how God did it the first time in the book of Acts. And we see on that day is what we already have, have, have read together today. The first message to the church, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And they say, what should we do? And he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And this promise is to you and to your children and to them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So it was a natural progression. You saw his death, you saw his burial, you witnessed his resurrection, you follow that pattern. Death, burial, resurrection, repentance, baptism, Holy Ghost. There it is. But then as the gospel began to spread to Judea, it began to go from house to house until thousands of believers are added to the church. And then the church begins to multiply. It's absolutely amazing the discipleship that is going on. And, and, and the structure of the church has to adjust because of its growth. And then here, coming out of this new structure, this adjusting for growth, now God has diocony or deacons that go out and they begin to serve. And, and of them, God taps one named Philip and he goes to the Samaritans when he goes to the Samaritans the, the, the Jewish church did not go with him because they had a bias against Samaria they would walk to Galilee another way they would not walk through Samaria even though it was shorter to go through Samaria and yet Jesus had planted a seed there with a woman at the well. And now he is sending Philip to go and see how that seed has now been watered. And it was time for a harvest because he told him the spirit would come to Jerusalem, Judea. And then it would come to Samaria. He said, I haven't left them out. The Samaritans are going to receive the gospel and they're going to have the Holy Spirit. God changed the dynamic. I don't have time to go through what Samaria is and what that means to us, but there was a political difference, there was a religious difference, and there was a lifestyle difference between them. There was a long-standing debate over the genealogies over who was the right uh, priestly line to follow, and the Samaritans followed one line and the Jews followed another. That's why there was a big argument. Where should we, where should we worship in this mountain or should we worship in Jerusalem? And uh, Jesus made, settled the argument for her. But he explained that there's something better than just your Jewish position or Samaritan position. How about I put a well in you that springs up into everlasting life and you won't have to come back to this well again. I want to give you my Holy Spirit. It's going to come upon you. He is, he, is, he is preparing the ground. And so Philip goes and preaches and he's received. But the pattern is different. He starts by casting out devils. And healing the sick he didn't come by saying repent he first came in and said oh I see some sick people and you know what Jesus heals sick people and they get healed and then he sees demon possessed people and they had never seen the devils cast out and the devils go out and they're going this is amazing and so then he starts teaching to them uh, uh, repentance and then he teaches them baptism but the Holy Spirit didn't fall on any of them it didn't happen the same way that it happened in Acts chapter 2. And he realizes Peter has the keys. I have to go submit this to Peter. He has to be a part of this progression because God has tapped him to be the one that opens the door as the progression of God happens. And so here comes Peter and John. And when they walk in, they see what's happening. And they immediately sense God is here. God is working. And we better, we better get on. We better get on this same bandwagon with God. We cannot miss this moment. How many know some? Sometimes God is working in places and we need to catch up with what God is doing and not miss our moment. 
It's possible for us to get stuck in our little rut, stuck in our little tradition, stuck in our little ideology, stuck in even our little church culture. And God is saying, I've got more people that I want to reach. And I need you to adjust your mind and say, they may not all look like you or sound like you, but I'm ready to save them just like I saved you. <laughs> and so Peter goes down and he lays hands upon them and they immediately receive the Holy Spirit. Wow. And so this is how God opens the door to the Samaritans. How? In Acts chapter 10, Peter is staying in the house of Simon the Tanner. Now you know that God has already been dealing with him if he's, if he's at the house of Simon the Tanner. Because a tanner was, had a love-hate relationship. The rabbis had a love-hate relationship with a tanner. Because a tanner had all these unclean beasts in his backyard they were unclean because they were dead and if you touch something that was dead you were unclean until the evening and so in order to get the skins the parchments that they would write on they had to touch a dead carcass but that same skin would be tanned and over a period of time uh, it would be in the right place and the oils would be put on it and it would be useful for them to write on the scrolls and so they would knock on the front door to get the scroll where they would write the word of god on it and yet they didn't want to talk to the tanner because he might be unclean from having touched a dead animal it was literally a house of change it went from unclean and dead to being sanctified to such a degree that the very word of God would be written upon it and it would be held in the highest regard where even when they would pull it out and roll the scroll out, everyone would go into a hush and then they would take it and put it back in a very special place. And you think something that, that dirty and something that ugly and something that unclean could end up like that? And yet here is Peter living in the house of someone that he could possibly be defiled by at any time. Time. something is happening with Peter I believe that God had positioned him there on purpose because he wanted to show him another level of revelation that even when you think something is dirty and unclean and it only just affects you in a negative way there is a possibility of change that the Word of God can sanctify anyone it can change anyone that's why the Bible says in such words some of you but now you are washed how many have seen people that have been a mess seen people that have been a wreck but somehow the power of God got a hold of their life I could name a whole row of people here I could go down the row and say I knew you win I saw you win I know where you came from I'm not gonna tell everybody about that but I can tell you this uh, this is how I fight my battles with the blood and with my testimony how many have a testimony today Come on, I see some hands raised over here. I see some people over here. You got a testimony. I was left for dead. I was dirty and smelly and nasty and nobody wanted to touch me. Whoever I touched, I just made them worse. But then Jesus, <laughs> Jesus got a hold of me and he changed my life. Oh, my Lord. Wow. So from the back door to the front door, there was this massive transformation. It was huge. Now God has Peter there. Simon Peter. Obstinate, stubborn, impetuous. The man who was always right, Peter. First one with a hand raised because his opinion. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Peter, James, and John are all up on the Mount of Transfiguration. James and John are just standing there. Peter goes, I know. Let's build three tabernacles. The Bible says because he didn't know what to say. I just love that he had to say something. Everybody knows somebody like that. They just have to say something. This is Peter. And God has him here with Simon. No doubt he was a disciple. No doubt he was a Jew. But this was his job. And God appears to Cornelius about three hours north. A Gentile who feared God. That means that he understood the Jewish practices, the people that were around him, and that he observed 
uh, he observed them and showed respect to them. He was giving a lot to the poor, and he was praying all the time. This is a totally different pattern. When you go to Acts chapter 2, Peter is standing there and saying, you slew Jesus and you put him on the cross. It was because of your decision that your Messiah was crucified. And it's cut to their heart. Ugh, what shall we do? Repent. I mean, this is a powerful, surging message. But God, when he deals with the Gentiles, he goes, it's going to be a little different. I'm going to start with the, with the God-fearing people. I'm going to start with the people that are sincere. They don't know everything they need to know. They don't have all the revelation that they need to have, but they're really good people. I'm going to start with the people that are already trying to do good, already given to the poor. You see a lot of the progression of God. You'll see these movements where you'll have Salvation Army type movement. They're out giving to the poor. Their motivation is that, that this is what the gospel is. Is to help people, is to get out in the community, is to touch those that are less fortunate, that the gospel should have a practical output that is seen by the community. Not just at the church, what the church takes in, but what the church gives out. And so he says, the first thing that got heaven's attention, he said, your alms and your prayers have come up before God. Now, he is not yet in the covenant. He's not received the Holy Spirit. He's not even repented yet. Not that we know of. But the Bible says he was just a God-fearer. He was someone that respected and just wanted to do the right thing. He was a sincere man. God says, this is how this movement for the Gentiles is going to be. It's going to be a progression of sincere, honest-hearted people that care about others. He said, that's going to be the open door. Now watch what it does. It connects them to the supernatural. Now, folks, this does not make any sense to the Jews. It doesn't make any sense to the Samaritans. It wouldn't fit inside of their theology because Peter would have a hard time even eating with these people. Why would God send an angel to an old Roman centurion? And sometimes we think that God has to check with us before he sends somebody an angel. God has to check with us before a supernatural can happen or before miracles can take place. But you know what? I think God does that on purpose sometimes to break us out of our little boxes, uh, of our little denominationalism and our little, st our little group think. And he says, you know what? If you're sincere and if you are hungry and if you are praying and you got my attention, guess what? I can send an angel to you. I can let the supernatural show up. He doesn't know. He doesn't hardly know anything. And yet an angel comes to him. What I'm telling you is that God may already be setting the stage for us and we don't even know it God is already arranging things and we don't even know it there are angels that are slipping into people's houses right now across Pasadena and Houston and this greater area people that are hungry maybe they don't go to church no 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 but they got God's attention somewhere because there's something in their heart that says I want to do the right thing and I just don't know what to do I just don't know what my next step is and God said I'm going to do this different I'm going to slip in and say hey I'd like to arrange an appointment with you I'd like to arrange a meeting I'm going to tell you somebody that you need to talk to and they will give you your next step you already have my attention you already got through with your prayers your almsgiving has already got the attention of heaven wow, wow. whole group of people that are outside the category God is working with. Peter's trying to just evangelize more, more Jewish people. Philip's still hanging out with the Samaritans. God says, that's good. That's nice. But you know what? I died for everybody. <laughs> and so Peter's up on the roof, and the Bible says he's up on the roof at the sixth hour. But Cornelius was visited by the angel at the ninth hour so for Cornelius it was later in the day everyone say later in the day there was a deeper sense of urgency in the spiritual realm about Cornelius and yet Peter is at high noon he's at the sixth hour now what does the sixth hour tell us 
What is the sixth hour? With a sundial, shadow of turning. Right? The Bible says every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, in whom is no variableness, neither what? Neither shadow of turning. That means for God, there's no shadow on the sundial. It's always just light. The only time when there's no shadow is at high noon. That's when the sun is directly overhead. This means this is the brightest time of the day or the greatest amount of light. Peter is standing in the full light of revelation. This is what this is about. Sixth hour of the day. You have exposure to the light. You know, you know the revelation. You have the keys. This man is already in a shadow. He's at 3 o'clock, and the sun is going down on his life, and someone has to step into that gap. Somebody has to understand that God is working with them, and I need you, someone who has light, to get the same urgency to get out there and touch that person who the sun is going down on. But look what happened to Peter. He fell into a trance, the Bible says. He was suspended. The word trance means to be suspended in time. It means that your senses are not engaged in reality at that moment. It means that he was just in the spiritual dimension. He was physically hungry, and while he was physically hungry, he fell into this trance, and then God used his physical hunger as a catalyst to explain something to him about a spiritual hunger that was in the earth. This is why we fast and pray. This is what this month of consecration is about. It's us saying, God, I, I, I'm giving up my physical hunger to tap into the spiritual hunger that is in the world, to hear the voice of God, and to receive fresh direction from God. Now, Peter was having another phenomenal experience. He's carried away in the presence of God up on the roof. But what does God do? What does God do? He shows him all of these animals that as a Jew he would never eat. Creeping things and beasts. And then he says, rise, slay, and eat. Say it with me. Say, rise, slay, and eat. Now what does Peter as a Jew say? Oh, no. If you're tempting me, God, to compromise. Oh, no, no, I'm not going to compromise. I refuse to touch the unclean thing. And he goes, oh, you totally missed it. Bring it back up again. Drops it back down a second time. All right, Peter. Rise, slay, and eat. Oh, but if you tempt me but a second time, Lord, yet I will remain true. Oh, boy. Okay, this guy's really a hard one. Okay, let's bring it up again. Let's drop it back down a third time. Ready? Rise. Slay. And he stands there and he goes, Are you trying to tell me something, God? I think God's trying to tell me something. What is it? The Jewish mindset is if I touch this beast that is unclean, you're not a beast and you're not unclean, okay. But if I touch it, it's going to make me like it. It is a fear mentality. And so what we teach is, oh, you better be careful. You know, some of those people you hang around, they'll rub off on you. Oh, you better be careful, man. I mean, all those people saying all that negative, nasty stuff, you better stay separate, stay away from them. Okay. And we say things like that as a protection. But there comes a point when the overflow of the Spirit of God and the character of Christ should be strong enough in us and our convictions and our lifestyle should be so strong that the world does not consume us. We are not consumed by the world. He says, I want you to get up and I want you to conquer it. I want you to rise. I want you to slay it. I want you to take it under your power. I want you to destroy it, and then I want you to assimilate it. This is what the gospel does. We rise up. We kill what is wrong in the society, in the community, in the culture, and then it becomes converted. It becomes a part of us. We do not become a part of it. It becomes a part of us. Peter, rise, slay and eat stop being so afraid 
Stop being so afraid. Oh, they're going to rub off on me. You know what? Maybe you could rub off on them if you'd love them enough to just sit down with them, put your arm around them, and say, how can I help you? Maybe we could be with somebody that's struggling with an addiction, and all they needed was somebody to reach out. They just needed somebody to care and tell them what their next step is. They just needed someone to tell them, what's my next step? That's all I need is a divine appointment with somebody that can give me my next step. But the church is so afraid. We're so afraid to touch people, so afraid to be there, so afraid to be in that room. And God has to tell us to rise, slay, and eat. So the Bible says, now this is what he does. This is what we do too. Or maybe I should say this is what I do too. I'll make it easier for you. The Bible says he doubted in himself. Did I really hear from God? Was that truly a vision? Most of the things that are real conviction from God are the ones that we always question. When it's consecration or change or transition in our life, those are the ones that we go, I'm not sure if I heard God or not. When it's, I'm going to bless you and you're going to do great things, oh, I know I heard from God. Don't you talk me out of that one. <laughs> he's up in this high place. He, he, he's in the house. Someone's taking care of him. They're, they're, they're feeding him. He's got all this revelation. He's fallen out in trances. Life is good. And God says, Peter, make the shift. I'm doing something right now. I need you to shift. I need you to stop thinking about it. I need you to stop talking about it. I need you to stop questioning amongst yourself. And I need you to hear me. They, they knock on the door right after the vision is over. And they're asking for Peter. And they're saying, hey, we were sent here. God sent us here. And then the voice says, rise up, Peter. And go with them and don't doubt anything. Rise and go with them and don't doubt anything. Stop all of this internal mechanism in your mind of whether we can do it or whether we can't do it. Make the shift. It's time to go. You're going into a place you've never been before. You're going to be with people that you've never been used to being around. It's been uncomfortable, but I'm about to use you. I gave you the keys and you're going to have to use those keys to move into a new dimension where an open door can come. But that open door doesn't happen unless you make the shift. Touch somebody say make the shift. If you want to go to the next level this year, you're going to have to do things you've never done. You're going to have to go places you've never gone. You're going to have to say yes to God when times when you've been hesitating before. And you're going to have to override the self-doubt. And you're going to have to override all the questioning in yourself. And you're going to have to accept, you know what? God is talking to me right now. I just didn't want to hear what he had to say. But I've got to get out there and stop talking about it. And it's time for us as TCT to start doing what God has showed us in this last decade he wants to do there is a progression of God and you know what he's saying I will set up the appointment but you've got to go God has an appointment with some of you here today for a new dimension for a new horizon for a new anointing but you have to make the shift in your mind you have to stop saying, well, that's not going to be uh, acceptable. And people are not going to know why they, they're going to talk about me. Well, you know what? I, you know, I just don't know. And God says, stop with all of that. Stop doubting. Stop questioning. And just say, I told you three times, rise, slay, and eat. Don't let it consume you. You're supposed to get up. You're supposed to rise up. You're supposed to wake up right now. Get out of this just wanting to hang out on the rooftop and get down there where I can and make a difference in your life. Pentecostals have the biggest temptation to do this because we have a lot of experiences. And so we just want to hang out on the rooftop for the next vision. And God said the vision is there to be a catalyst. It's there to be a catalyst. Whew. And there's a certain amount, are you ready, of vulnerability that's involved. But what are the brethren going to think? 
if I go to Cornelius' house. He takes six witnesses. You only need two or three according to Jewish law. He takes twice the amount. I want them all to observe. I did not touch anything dead. As he walks over a carcass at Simon the Tanner's house. You have been doing this already, Simon. You've been in the house with Simon the Tanner, Simon Peter. I've been trying to teach you this every single day. It's been all around you. Now I have to give you a vision. And you're still going, hmm, do you think we need to make disciples? Wow. You know, I think disciples shift. Wait a minute. Isn't that a word that we've seen somewhere around here? Yeah, we even have an app. What is disciple making, folks? What is it? Disciple making is the unclean becomes clean. This is what he told to Peter. That which you have called common, that, that, don't, that which you've called common, don't you call it unclean? I can take something that you call common and unclean and I can make it clean again. In other words, I made you holy and if I could make you holy, then I can make anybody holy. If I could pull you, Peter, from where I pulled you from, do you remember where I got you? You know, it, it, it's not just a phrase, you know, to curse like a sailor. I mean, they, they do that. There's a whole culture that was there, and he pulled him out of all of that, and he's filled him with the Holy Ghost, and he's doing miracles and signs and wonders, and he says, now, Peter, I want the same change that's worked out in you. I want you to take that with you, and I want you to rise and slay and eat. So this is what I say, this is what I say, Mayor, Mayor Wagner, my brother, that we are seeing a transformation in Pasadena because we've got godly people that are serving. We've got godly people that are stepping up and say, we're not just going to call it business as usual because we believe that this town has a destiny this city has a future and we know that something is changing we're not going to let it affect us the churches are going to rise up together and we're going to say yes that used to be a bad neighborhood yes that used to be a bad apartment complex but we got bible studies going on in there i got big d and his whole crew in there and they're teaching them all and they're coming to church now and I got X everything sitting in the church here today because Jesus said, I don't care where you came from. I don't care what you did. This gospel will work for anybody. Either it kills us or we kill it. There is no neutral ground in this. Either the church becomes a, 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 a city that's set on a hill that does not have a light or we have, or we have a light that everyone can see. Either we are salt that is salty or if we lose our saltiness, we are just thrown out in the road and we have no reason to be here. What Jesus said of the church in Ephesus, he said, you lost your first love and I will remove your candlestick. If you don't love souls, if you don't love lost people, if you don't care about the gospel being preached, then I will take your candlestick away. Peter, go. He walks in the door. I got four minutes. He walks in the door. And I love hunger, Brother John. I love hunger. I know you do too. That's why I have a Bible study every Friday night. Hunger is what motivates me, folks. That's what gets me excited. Hungry people are never offended. But Peter walks in and he goes, make sure I didn't step on anything. I wouldn't normally eat with you people. And they all just go, isn't that so cool? We got a Jew in our house. This is just so awesome. Look at this guy walking in. This is, so, this is such a God thing. Isn't it so cool? And then he goes, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. I mean, if you said that walking into someone's house, think about how that would sound. 
I wouldn't normally eat with people like you, but I have perceived that God is no respecter of persons. <laughs> I'd be like, uh-oh. Oh, I see how you see this situation here. You know what? Maybe we've ran out of food and you should just go. They walk up to him and they go, oh yeah, whatever. Okay. You know, an angel told us that you were coming. He told us to go get you. It's so awesome. Oh, man of God. And they get down on their knees in front of the guy because they're so reverent. And he has to pick them up and say, oh no, 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 don't, don't worship me. An angel told us that about you. They're so hungry. And his own prejudice and his own barriers, his own religious barriers, almost sabotaged the whole thing. And God said, you can't stop this. Just make the shift. Just do this. And he starts to teach. And as he teaches, here's the next progression. So it's angels. It's divine appointments. It's a shift. And then... While he is speaking, the Holy Ghost falls. There was no baptism. There was no call for repentance. While he is talking about Jesus, they go, oh, I got it. I can have the Holy Ghost. Oh, that's awesome. And pow, the Holy Ghost falls on them. Just like that. And he never even explained it very much. It was like he just got into the revelation of who Jesus was. And as he was talking about the revelation of who Jesus was, God said, I'll take it from here. I'll take it from here. And God gave them a brand new tool of evangelism called mass evangelism. He didn't have to pray for them individually. He didn't have to lay his hands upon them. He just spoke the word. And while he is speaking the word, the Holy Ghost falls. This is the decade of pay on the Jewish calendar. What is it? It's mouth. 80 in Jew in the in the Jewish language is pay. It's mouth. This is the decade where God is going to expand the influence of the church and it's going to come through the spoken word where we're going to be able to speak and as we speak he's going to multiply its influence and it's not just going to be one or two. It's going to be whoever's in the house is going to immediately receive that word and the Holy Ghost is going to fall. What took a long time for Jews to figure out they had to pray for seven days. Gentiles have a seven-minute sermon, and the Holy Ghost falls. I'm ready for God to do a quick work. It's going to fall all over the world. We're going to see a Holy Ghost outpouring like we have never seen. Oh, stand with me right now and clap your hands to the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Here's the progression. You see the progression. 750 million people now speak with tongues around the world. And they all started with someone who feared God. It all started with somebody that was hungry. It all started with somebody that was just praying and got God's attention. And God said, there's another step for you. There's more for you. And what does Peter do after they're filled with the Holy Ghost? He's in shock. He said, they've received the Holy Ghost. Go to the next verse, verse 45. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished. This is his six men. As many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles was also poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Verse 46. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Verse 47. Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized? Notice this last phrase. Which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we. They got the same thing that we got the same experience that we got in Acts 2 they got here in Acts 10 they were shocked I didn't know God did this for Gentiles and he says yes and he said if God would give them the Holy Ghost then who are we to stand in the way of them being a part of the body of Christ by being baptized verse 48 what does he do and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. 
He didn't suggest it to them. He didn't say, this might be a good idea. He turned to them and said, all right, I'm here in the Holy Spirit. I'm here because God sent me. An angel arranged this uh, situation. He put me on this location. I have the authority in this house to represent God. And I'm telling you, you must be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. He commanded them to be baptized, and he baptized the whole house and stayed with them for several days while they began to talk about this new experience and new salvation and new revelation that was in their life. What this tells me in the progression of time is that the last thing that's going to come upon the earth after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is that there's going to be a sweeping revelation of the name of Jesus where people are going to identify with his name like they have never identified it. They're going to get the revelation revelation of the name of Jesus and its significance and its importance. A Jesus name revival. And all of this is waiting, folks, for us to make the shift. So if you're here today, you say, you know what? I'm that hungry one that needs to know what my next step is. I'm ready for God to give me the understanding and the revelation that I need. Maybe, maybe you need to be baptized today. This is, this is your next step. Maybe you need the Holy Ghost. Maybe that's your next step. Maybe you've never repented. That's your next step. Then you need to take that step. If you're here today and you say, Pastor, I, I got the revelation. I understand. I can't stay on the rooftop. I've got to be mobilized. i got to do something. People are waiting on me. There's people I have to reach. Okay, God, I'm going to let him change the way that I think. I'm not going to get in my own way. That's your next step. Your next step may be the difference in a whole generation. It may be a difference in a whole house. It may be an open door. Your obedience. I'm inviting everyone here today that is ready to make the shift and take the next step. I want you to come and stand right now. Come and stand. I'll pray with you. of this generation is strong it's determined the Bible says it would be like the days of Lot and like the days of Noah there's resistance there there's perversion there there's hate there we feel it but God worked in the days of Noah and he worked in the days of Lot and he's telling us the same thing that if that culture could be assimilated into the church in the book of Acts we can rise we can make the shift we can slay it we can eat I'm going to pray with you right now that God will help us pray with us also as a church that God will help us you and me to make the shift Father we're coming to you right now in the name of Jesus we are opening up our hearts to you, Father. And we are saying in the name of Jesus, I will be obedient. I will take the next step. I will reach, oh God. I will move. I am hearing you, God. You are activating me. You are telling me to get up and go. And not to doubt anymore. Not to second guess anymore. Get up and go. Go make a difference. Go preach where you've never preached. Go talk where you've never talked. Go touch people you've never touched. Father, we're going to make a shift as a church this year. We're going to get out in our community like we've never gotten out of our community. We're going to make a difference, oh God, like we've never made a difference. We're going to see transformation happen through discipleship, through small groups. We're going to see transformation happen by new leaders rising up. Oh, God, I thank you, Lord. You're calling people right now. You're calling people, and you are delivering us from this culture. 
You're delivering us, oh God, from the dead things. You're delivering us, oh God, today. In the name of Jesus, I want you to touch somebody next to you right now, if you will. And I want you to pray that God's anointing, that God's anointing will come upon them right now. Because there's more in us than what has been released. Hallelujah. There's more doors that are in you that need to be opened than have been opened. We're going to pray it right now. God, I'm asking you in Jesus' name, if you've given us keys to new doors. And Father, today in Jesus' name, let that anointing come and unlock those doors in Jesus' name. Right now, Father, mobilize us, move us, oh God. Use us, Lord. I've got a shift. i got a shift, oh God. I gotta make the shift. We as a church have to make the shift. We gotta make the jump. Our Pasadena has gotta shift. Houston has to shift. This generation has to shift. Our young people have to shift. Triumph Kids Live has to shift. Our millennials have to shift. Our culture, our church culture cannot be swallowed up by the world we have to be a place where they can come here and be transformed god help me help me oh god to have something internal that is greater than everything that is external in the name of jesus Jesus is here right now. Why don't we clap our hands to the Lord now and just give him praise across this. a lot of big things. This was our first installment of this. Next week, we're going to come back and talk a little bit more specifics. Thank you so much for being a part of our service today. If you want to be baptized, you can be baptized today. If you want someone to pray for you, we're ready to pray for you today. If you want to stay a little longer, God bless you. Thank you. For those of you that are ready to shift, the door is open. Walk through it. Amen. Go and go with God today.